Awesome. And we are live. Thank you all so much for joining us today. You are in the right place at the right time. Welcome to the Hunt Institute's first race and education webinar for 2021. Happy Tuesday. How are you? And happy new year. We could not be more grateful that you've decided to take time out of your busy schedules to join us for this important conversation on community activism and coalition building for educational equity. Uh, and to lead the co today's conversation, we have Sharonda Bassier, Deputy Director of the Education Leaders of COLA, uh, Rosa Clemente, journalist, political commentator, and organizer, Alberto Retana, President and CEO of COCO South LA, and the Honorable Malcolm Kenyatta, State Representative of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Thank you all immensely for leading this conversation. Uh, while we do have our amazing resource experts leading co today's conversation, that does not mean we do not want to hear from you. Uh, please feel free to use the hashtag race and education on Twitter so that we can hear your comments and engage with you there. Also at the bottom of your screen, please use the Q&A tool to post your questions and comments throughout today's conversation. Uh, and with that, I wanna just take a brief moment to thank all the people in the Hunt Institute who have worked behind the scenes to make today's conversations happen. Jen, Julia, Abigail, Cheryl, Ramon, uh, Joni, and Keebler for all of your great work doing outreach to make today's event happen. And with that, I am going to turn it over to the Hunt Institute's Empathetic Director of Equity Initiatives, Ramon de Jesus, to get the conversation started. Thank you, Senegal. And welcome everyone again to the first episode in the Hunt Institute's 2021 lineup of the Race and Education webinar series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Ramon de Jesus and I serve as the Director of Equity Initiatives here at the Hunt Institute. The Hunt Institute was created by four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt to be an education policy resource to state leaders looking to champion educational equity in their communities. This webinar series is a continuation of that work, allowing us to explore and interrogate some of the most salient conversations at the intersection of race and American public education. This year, we have a great lineup of conversations planned for you, spanning topics that examine the intersections of racism and gender in education policy, the power of the arts as a vehicle for culturally responsive pedagogy, and the invisible tax carried by educators of color. We hope that you will join us for these conversations in the future and information around those events will be dropped in the chat. Now, I'd be remiss to not address the attempts to violently delay and overturn the will of the American people last Wednesday. The covert and overt racism of that moment were on full display. So now, more than ever, we believe that shining a light on the ways in which race, race permeates all facets of life is of supreme importance. In light of what we have recently experienced, I can think of no better conversation than the one we are having today, focusing on how the will of the people can form coalition to execute change in education. I would like to thank today's panelists, some old and some new friends, Rosa Clemente, Alberto Retana, and Representative Malcolm Kenyatta for your willingness to share your expertise and enthusiasm for organizing communities and giving them the tools to champion and imagine new realities. I also want to, to thank my dear friend, Sharonda Bassier for moderating this event and for her deep commitment to students, families, and leaders of color. I'm excited to have you lead this important conversation. With that, I will turn it over to you, Sharonda, to get this conversation started. Thank you so, so much uh, for that introduction. And good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon DeBassier. Uh, I am the founding deputy director and current interim CEO of Education Leaders of Color. Uh, Education Leaders of Color, or EDLOC, is a national membership organization serving about 400 uh, mostly Black and Latino educators across uh, 40 states. Uh, we provide professional development, networking, policy, and funding support to educators who are focused on disrupting cycles of generational poverty in the communities they serve. Uh, I am also a Black queer educator, organizer, and activist, a first-generation college graduate, and origin originally from the Watts section of Los Angeles. Uh, I am really, really excited to moderate this conversation today with this panel of rock stars. Um, I feel like I'm going to learn a lot. <laughs> I feel like I get to hang out with the cool kids. Um, and so please, to the extent that you all desire, we are all from call and response cultures, engage in the chat, please drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, you know, we want this to feel like we're sitting around a table breaking bread, having conversations about what matters to us 
in this moment, what calls us to this work, and certainly how we center the voices, experiences, and needs of our country's most vulnerable young people. So um, with that, I am going to invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, because we have been talking a lot about the importance of identity and shaping our experiences, worldview, and values, I'm going to ask each of you also to share a bit about how you identify what brings you to the work that you do um, as you answer our sort of opening question, right, which is how have you seen uh, community organizing lead to more equitable education outcomes for the young people who are living their lives on the margins of society. And with that, Rosa, I'm going to invite you to kick us off. Hi, thank you, everybody. And um, for all of those who are dealing with COVID or loss, folks, I, you know, feel y'all. And thank you to all the elected officials that are on the right side, not the ones that have been on the wrong side for four years, even longer, and now want us to be in unity. I'm a Black Puerto Rican born in the South Bronx. I am an organizer, independent journalist, producer, soon to be Dr. Clemente. I deal with issues around Afro and Black Latino, Latina, Latinx identity, particularly in the United States. In 2008, I ran for vice president of the United States with Cynthia McKinney, on the Green Party ticket to this day, we're the only ticket of a women of color in American presidential politics and history. And um, a lot of my work now is geared towards creating narratives visually, engaging really with, with young people, um, those under 35. And I've been organizing since I was an undergraduate and I continue to organize even as a PhD student. Um, I come out of Black studies and the model of Black studies, one of them is to be a scholar activist. So that's about me. Thank you, Alberto. Hi, um, my name is Alberto Retana. I identify as a brown man. Um, I am, uh, uh, who hails, whose family hails from my mother from Mexico and my father from Costa Rica. I'm pretty um, uh, explicit now um, in most recent times as a, identifying as a, as a non-Black uh, Latino organizer. Uh, that's where um, it's important that I think we identify and, and call it out. Um, it's really important to me uh, as an organizer um, to identify as a brown man in particular because um, uh, to be Latinx oftentimes gets deracialized either as I mean, either being non-Black or non-Indigenous. Uh, all of the images we see mostly on Telemundo are white skinned actors and we don't have a very nuanced conversation about uh, race. So I identify as a brown man, it's very important. I used to identify as a Chicano in college, uh, largely for political purposes because it was the one political term we had that uh, was a wedge against uh, white supremacy. But uh, since then I've, uh, I've sort of uh, embraced uh, uh, brown as, as my identity uh, these days. With that said, I hope that um, we can do more uh, in the Latinx community to talk about race and change the discourse so that we're a lot more clear about uh, not buying into the assimilationist um, thinking of, of what it means to be an American uh, in the United States. With that said, your question is an important question about organizing. Uh, you know, organizing for me is really incredibly important. It's a, it's a verb, not just a word. It's uh, to be perpetually in forward motion uh, hopefully the organizing that I've been involved in is constantly in the act of liberating uh, and liberating us from oppressive conditions in schools, in hospitals, in communities. Uh, I think organizing has been incredibly uh, uh, useful tool that's a democratic tool that allows everybody, not just certain people, to get involved in the business of dismantling uh, white supremacy and advancing a multiracial democracy, a real democracy and real rights. Most recently, uh, it's been interesting to watch the interaction between organizing, activism, movements, and uprising result in pretty significant changes, uh, most recently in Los Angeles. Because of all of this work over the last decade and the most recent uprisings that we've seen on the streets, led by Black Lives Matter, young people were able to advance a 35% cut in the LA police, school police department, a cut of $25 million 
from a $70 million budget, redirecting those funds directly to black students. We're in the process of identifying how those funds uh, should be advanced. Uh, that could have never happened without the movement work, without the street work, and certainly without the decade of organizing that had been put in over the last uh, uh, several years to make this possible. So that's a really ex exciting uh, moment in history in Los Angeles. We seek to you know, keep pushing for more. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be in conversation with this, uh, with this group. Um, and, I, and I wanna emphasize something that Ramon said and also something that Rosa said. Um, I'll start by first, you know, acknowledging that just yesterday in Pennsylvania, 327 more people um, lost their lives from COVID. These numbers have been growing every single day. And so again, for anybody who's been impacted, infected, touched by this, um, all of us have been touched by it, but for folks who lost people, um, just my heart is with you. So I don't think we can start any conversation without acknowledging that reality. Um, the second reality is we need to acknowledge the white supremacist domestic terror attack that happened yesterday on the Capitol. And that is directly connected to this conversation because it's, it really is a reminder of the fragility of this experiment in self-government. Um, I like to always say there is nothing written on a tablet somewhere that says America has to succeed. I think we are used to fairy tale stories that you know, <laughs> have a beginning, a peak and an ending, everything works out. Um, what activism says, what organizing says is, we can't wait for it to just magically work out. Um, the reason it works out is because we speak up and speak out from our experience and demand that every single one of our voices be included um, in the conversation that our communities. Um, you know, I'm a poor black gay kid from, from North Philly. Um, that's how I identify. And when people often ask, you know, well, Malcolm, why did you get involved in, in politics? And I wish I had a really fancy answer. Um, but the answer is, I was poor. Um, you know, I still, even as an elected official, live paycheck to paycheck. People in my communities were, were poor. Um, and we went to schools where I'm a young guy, but we went to schools where the most recent president in our textbook, <laughs> George H.W. Uh, Bush, were, were teachers. Uh, much like today, we're going into their pockets. Um, because they did care to provide us what we needed to be successful and to thrive and, and, and to learn. And every day as an elected official can confront this austerity mindset as it comes to making the types of investment that actually make our communities healthy and whole. I mean, you cannot continue to do what we've done here in Pennsylvania where, where you grew up, not hypothetically, not just as a talking point, it literally decides the type of and the quality of education you receive in Pennsylvania and the disparity in funding and the coalition, frankly, that has been formed that keeps those disparities in place. That coalition that sometimes includes people I consider colleagues and friends um, who don't wanna have a tough conversation about how we reallocate resources in a way that actually meets the needs of the young people in every district, in every county um, here in Pennsylvania. And so it is something that remains a persistent challenge. And I would just end with something I always say, addressing deep poverty is the moral and economic issue of our generation. Um, you name an issue and I can show you how it connects to the fact that we have an economy that is upside down as it relates to working people and the working poor and our inability to address that um, has led to disparate outcomes in every single part of our society, um, probably most pronounced um, in our education system. And I know we'll talk a lot about that. And so I'm always grateful to hold space with people who understand the power of their voices and who understand that bravery begets bravery. And when we step up, it's not about us stepping up, but it's about us encouraging other people to also step out, live in their truth and use their full voice um, to create the type of you know, bold change that we need for them. Thank you for that. I, I, I wanna talk a little bit about your work as a state legislator, right? And I'm especially interested in how your history of organizing informs your work as a legislator. And I'm curious if there are new opportunities for change, right, that have presented themselves to you over the course of the past few months or year that were not necessarily present when you were elected. 
Yeah, so I'll start with the last part of that in terms of what new opportunities might be available. We're, we're, we're gonna find out, <laughs> we're gonna find out because I think the big lie that has been told over and over and over again um, by my colleagues that the election was somehow rigged that we should only count legal votes with the subtext of that being that votes of black and brown folks are not legal qualifying votes um, in this country and the constant drumbeat has meant that, you know, my Republican colleagues who I, you know, I've been jokingly saying, but really, really seriously, you know, used to vacation on Fantasy Island. Now they live there full time. And it is really difficult to do anything from a place of shared facts, um, even when there used to be um, broad agreement. You know, one of the things that I'm deeply committed to and hope we can get done this year is I had a young man, um, Little Phil, 12 years old, um, dealing with vicious bullying in his school, um, died by suicide um, about a year and a half ago at this point. Um, I had a Republican colleague who in the same time frame also had a young person, her district, who died by suicide. And when I said to Little Phil's family was, you know, we were gonna find a way to make sure we don't forget him and don't forget all the young people who are struggling in our schools um, with receiving the type of mental health cares and all the supports beyond just, you know, a worksheet and a good teacher. There's a lot of stuff that folks need outside of good teachers, no matter how important good teachers are, they need other people in that school environment who can help them with other challenges that they're having. And ultimately, you know, little Phil was failed. Um, and we, what we wanted to do was find a way to really reimagine the way we do mental health uh, service providing within our schools. And I worked with a, a Republican colleague, as I mentioned, um, Bill got 80 something co-sponsors um, for folks listening, getting 80 something co-sponsors in the Pennsylvania legislature is really hard. <laughs> but this is an area that there really should be widespread support. And I think it's one of the most important areas that I think about when I think about how we reimagine um, our schools as places where kids are holistically educated and holistically safe, frankly. Um, you know, if you have the challenge that I had as a kid growing up who moved five different times as a kid, that lack of stability and what that does, the, the feeling of constant scarcity affects our young people. The fact that 499 people were murdered in Philadelphia last year. If you just had somebody shot on your block and if you're, you don't know what's happening in your family and your housing situation, other things don't feel secure, it's very difficult to now sit down and do algebra, right? And so we have to address the challenges that that young person is bringing into the school. That's an area where there should be broad bipartisan support. And my background in trying to bring people together in our communities to talk about our experiences with the value that they deserve and then try to find as many people as possible who share that experience, right? To then get the numbers necessary to get it done. Um, we'll see if this time we, we, we can get it done. We need 102 votes um, to pass the bill at 87 votes uh, for that last legislation as, as I mentioned. Um, and there's still a very real need for us to address that. And so that is one of the things um, that I'm laser focused on, not only making sure we don't forget little Phil, but making sure we, we understand that there are a bunch of little Phil's who we need to step in and make sure are safe. Yeah, thank you. Alberto, I'm wondering if you can help us build on that a little bit, right? So Malcolm is talking about the importance of reaching across the aisle, building coalitions and partnerships in the legislature. And I'm wondering if you can talk about what that looks like in communities, right? Specifically, as it relates to articulating platforms that are reflective of communities' needs and ensuring that communities, particularly our highest need communities, right, are getting the resources they need to have the ability to do what Malcolm is talking about, right? Provide mental health support, reimagine what schooling looks like, et cetera. I mean, this is this is Coco's jam. This is where y'all 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 do it. Well, I would uh, thank you for that. I believe that um, I guess before getting into the platform and how we arrived at it, uh, there's a fundamental assumption that we carry with us as organizers, and that is that conditions are not permanent. Um, conditions do shape the environment and some of the possibilities or lack thereof, but conditions are malleable. The question the organizer thinks about is, well, what, what changes the condition? Now, oftentimes, people advance data 
people say that data is what's going to do the best research is what's going to move a policy the best data is what's going to move this policy let's just get the best stories together and if we just present stories i think there was a question around how do we convince mental more investment in mental health one approach well if we just just tell the stories of people inflicted by this we can move people's hearts towards justice and change and um, all of those things are important or we just need the right elected official we just get representative rep more folks like representative uh, Kenyatta in the mix, we can make this happen, right? Uh, all of this becomes a, 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 what I believe to be sort of idealist perceptions of, of how to change policy. When at the end of the day, policy is not changed because of the best data. It's not changed because of the best research. It's not changed because of the best stories. And it's not changed because of the best individuals in power. Um, that's, they're all factors. But ultimately, the way change functions in America is through power. It's a function of power. Conditions are shaped by who's in power, who has power, what moves power. So as an organizer, we're always confronted with that. So yes, we have to come up with the best stories. We have to find the right elected officials. We have to put together the best data and the best stories, but we have to organize people because what we're up against is organized money, organized white supremacy, organized institutions. So we have to bring that power to bear. Uh, coalitions or building coalitions is a way of building the kind of power needed, hopefully grounded in the right values to advance the kind of changes that we want to see. Uh, at Community Coalition, we're in the, in the business of organizing people every single day. Uh, you referenced the People First platform. The People First platform is our a policy agenda that's a bit outdated now that we uh, formulated in 2017. And the way we formulate policy agendas is we have mass conversations with mass amount of people to identify what's both deeply and widely felt, both what's popular and unpopular in our community. Sometimes those things are not the most popular amongst activists because activists a lot of times aren't deeply connected to what's happening on the ground. At the same time, because activists, uh, activists are really important because they're thinking about the politics and the analysis of what's happening, we have to involve deep political education amongst our community so that we take on the right issues. So in 2017, on the 25th anniversary of the LA uprising, we talked to 4,500 people, had face-to-face -face conversations, 30 minutes to an hour each to identify what are the things that people are thinking about? What are the things that people care about across 15 zip codes in South Central Los Angeles? Half of the 4,500 people we're talking to were high school students. The other half were 18 and above. 60% uh, of the folks we talked to were African-American. 40% of the folks we talked to were Latinx. Uh, and that began to identify and think about the issues that our community really cares about. So we do ask them about uh, police and defunding police. We ask them about what, all, what also matters when it comes to health, what matters when it comes to what's happening on your block. Those conversations then uh, help to shape an agenda that we can fight for. Uh, so our platform is broken into three, was broken into three tiers, demanding uh, public dollars, which is our money, uh, pushing for uh, a healthy, built environment or healthy communities uh, in, our, in our blocks. And then also pushing for generating justice, real justice reform, uh, real justice change, sort of reimagining justice. That's ultimately how we do it. But in order for the ideas of these 4,500 people to come to fruition, we have to build the kind of coalitions with organizations, with people to have the power to assert, hey, if we're gonna uh, move new money to the community's highest in need, that means folks in less need are gonna have to give up that money. Uh, and that's going to take power. That's going to take a level of pressure that thankfully the uprisings that we see, the organizing that we see, the movement that we saw over the summer created the opportunities to think about things differently. The last thing I'll say on this particular question, because I said it was outdated because things have changed so much in the last year. And uh, we rightfully addressed COVID and the pandemic and the impact on our communities. Uh, it's devastating. It's devastating on the loss of life that we're dealing with. It's devastating on the economic uh, burden that it's creating, the housing crisis that it's creating. It's devastating to see that the people that are getting protected are the rich white folks that don't have to leave their homes, but everybody else who's forced to work or doesn't, you know, or doesn't have a home, like in LA with the majority of houseless folks being black folks and the majority of folks working being brown folks. Uh, this is a, a, a prime example of the pre-existing conditions of racism and economic exclusion that we have to address. But make no mistake, we might think about addressing the pandemic, oh, we'll never go back to the way things were because people care now. Well, yes, but that's not enough. 
uh, we have to build the power because otherwise the alternative we're contending with is what we saw last week uh, with the white supremacist insurrection on the Capitol. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm muting myself because I know a manning doesn't really work well over Zoom. <laughs> it sounds like noise, but I, I love this idea that conditions are not permanent, right? And so, um, Rosa, I'm going to ask you to speak to sort of what the organizing work uh, and uprisings over the last year in particular, right, have highlighted for you around um, the changing conditions and, and, and in some instances, the worsening conditions, right, uh, particularly as they relate to inequity in education. Yeah, I, you know, obviously the uprisings this summer, they, they were, they were great, but um, I see them more as mobilizations and not full organizing, you know, um, and, and that's because of my experience being in Ferguson um, and particularly how Ferguson frontline warriors not only have lost so much, four of three of the African American men who were frontline warriors have been found mysteriously killed the last three years. A Palestinian brother mysteriously killed, and Joshua Johnson, who is still serving time for being part of that front line. So, as much as I know how important these summer mobilizations are, I, I I really disagree with people when they're like, this was like the longest historical time we've ever been in the streets, which is not true, <laughs> you know? Um, and that people have abandoned Ferguson and used Ferguson, especially a lot of educators and um, visible uh, folks that have high, high visibility, you know? And, and the conditions of our children in public school have not changed. They definitely have gotten worse. So living in New York City, I. I, I was a teacher in a public school and I left because that year was when the NYPD got the contract to come into public schools. And our school was chosen as one of the schools that would build a cell inside. And I was teaching in middle school. So if a student broke a rule, uh, usually young men fighting, but more of the African-American Latina girls were, um, were being suspended at a really high rate, um, being told that they were belligerent. So as a test school for that, one of the cuts came in history where I was teaching seventh and eighth graders, right? So the city could spend money to build a cell to hold a student before the police could come and get them and then arrest them in the school and take them to juvenile detention, they found that more important. And that was in the early 2000s. So I left public school teaching. Um, and progressively, it has gotten worse. In any, in any community where we are a majority or any um, big city, our kids are harassed by the police when they're walking to the train or the bus. Then when they get to the train and the bus, they're harassed and searched. Then they go and walk to their school, have to go through metal detectors, and then are harassed by the police in their schools. And I've seen it. Um, I've worked on a lot of police brutality cases that start that way. You know, so I think where we're at right now is that we have an opportunity to reimagine what public school education could look like because what it's looking like now, it's a breeding ground to the prison industrial complex. And there's many, many, many reports that make that connection. And also that African-American girls are now the more suspended or expelled. And again, belligerent, i.e. you don't like the tone or how a black you know, young woman says what she says because you're not treating her fairly in the school. You know, so for me, education can, is usually, a, or let's say formal education is mostly a process of socialization to get most of our kids to work in a capitalist system that does not give them anything. And now with COVID, what we're really seeing with COVID and why we have to keep bringing it in 
is because right now, one in four Latinos in the state of California are dying from COVID. Native American communities are being so decimated that the elders who pass on the language to their young people are, the languages might disappear, especially the Dakota language. And then that we're not, that we're the country that has the most deaths, it, I don't think it surprises us as organizers you know, I think, you know, this exceptionalism that America is the best, it's obviously not. Now, internationally, people are like, what? Like an attempted coup um, and, you know, a potential attempted military coup, because we're beginning to find out how many of those folks were in the military and police who are being fired all around this country right now or being put on leave because they were there. So to me, we, that's how we bring it all together with young people, because they are keen, keenly aware right now that for them, public education has been a failure. They're questioning why even go to college, if what job am I going to have? We've lost 25 million jobs. They're not coming back. Automation is at an all time high. And honestly, both the parties have been defunding schools, defunding community centers, defunding youth centers. I don't liken both parties to each other, especially after this week. But what I would say is that young folks are pretty clear that most elected officials have let them have let them down. down. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, 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 you know, that's something. Um, and last, just because, um, you know, what we saw right now and what we're seeing with COVID is highly traumatic. It's traumatic for us, but it's traumatic for young people. My daughter was like, okay, y'all messed up the planet, so we might not have clean air. You poison the water, we might not have water. You told us to go to school and get an education. And when I go to school, I'm harassed by the police. And now COVID. And the trauma inflicted on young people, but all of us, we have to get a handle around that. So I am 100% yeah. committed to working more around mental health issues as someone who has been public about my issues of mental health and, and work in the hip hop community so that black and Latino people of my generation know that it is a necessity at this point for our survival to actually be in therapy, to be with groups that deal with mental health. That's a perfect transition. I'm going to transition us to some of the audience questions because y'all have been in the in the Q and A, and I want to elevate some of these. But it's a perfect transition to Adam's question here, which is, how do we convince localities to invest in mental health professionals in schools? And if you all have examples of where you have seen, you know, particularly grassroots organizing efforts or campaigns be successful at securing dollars for those kinds of supports in schools, would love for you to elevate those so that folks know kind of where they can look for examples and guidance. Um, Alberto, you leaned in, so it looks like you might have some, some thoughts here. Yeah, I do. Oh. Oh, oh, I'll be quick well, on my Alberto, yeah. because both Alberto <laughs> representative Kenyatta spoke to this. Defund the police. That's it. Defund the police. New York City has no business spending 40% of its budget on police when LA organizers have shown us that it's possible, when Philadelphia DA and the younger people like Representative Kenyatta have come in with platforms that are completely progressive, even radical, defund the police. And then you have everything you need to put into what Alberto was talking about, what is called the community school model, where all the needs of a student and their families are met within this public education um, building in the community. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, as organizers, um, I mean, we all come from different thing, thinking and schools and so, but, um, one of the things for sure that I think is important in organizing is to think about what your long-term and your short-term plan is. And so your short-term game is always about the long-term. And so um, where are you trying to be five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, if you think you're gonna win uh, in six months, 
uh, then you haven't won enough because whatever you win in six months is not going to do enough. Uh, so it should be a, a stepping stone. So as I think about mental health and all of this and deep fun, I have to sort of lay out a longer term plan uh, for greater engagement. It also is a recognition that you have to go to those that are most directly impacted by the issue for the solutions. And it's an acknowledgement that leadership is everywhere and that leadership isn't about pedigree and about titles and about principles or about teachers. It's about everybody and getting particularly those students and families that are directly impacted to tell us what the issues are and to treat them as experts and to involve their solutions. You ask them, they'll tell you everything that Rose is telling, not Rose's idea, not, it's yeah. not like it, you know, this is something that students and families will tell you quite directly that they want. And so, yeah, I think defunding the police is gonna be a part of it, especially in our schools. They have no business in our schools, no business in our schools. Uh, I think the other thing is we have to tax the rich. It is, it is unfathomable that in this COVID period, the rich have gotten so much richer. It's insane the amount of wealth that has accumulated at the top while everybody else is suffering. When people talk about that pandemic, people talk about the economy going to crash. Man, are the wealthy really making a lot of money? And we have to have a conversation about equity, which means you take some of that money and you put it back into the areas most in need, put it in our schools to pay for the things that matter. Look, education equity is absolutely right. And I get it. Like, I think at times people want to really narrow in and think about, okay, what's happening in the classroom? Our students learning. Look, I got a nine-year-old who is, has to distance learn every day. You know, it's a struggle to get him to pay attention. And I feel like it's my fault that he's not uh, paying attention in front of a screen for five, four hours a day uh, to listen to someone talk about and hear, hear the teacher tell him, and there's a lot of teachers doing great work. A lot of teachers so just don't, don't hear what I'm saying wrong, but I hear my teacher tell my son, y'all don't care about education, pay attention. They're frustrated. This is an incredibly frustrating environment, but don't tell my nine-year-old, he doesn't know whether to care about education or not at this point. He's just, he misses his friends. He misses being able to engage with people on a daily basis. And now he's got to do a, a, a report, you know, uh, on a cultural hero. So I just, you know, I just think it's incredibly hard, but to think about education disconnected from the world that we're in, disconnected from COVID, disconnected from poverty, disconnected from houselessness uh, is, is a problem. Education equity has got to be about social justice and economic equity and racial justice. So we can't just continue to silo our education system. It's not enough to say, and I worked, I worked in the Obama administration. We, I was a part of the rhetoric that said, you know, poverty, we can't use poverty as an excuse. You're right, we shouldn't, but we can't narrowly ignore the reality that the conditions that our kids are living in are getting in the way of our ability to learn. We gotta tackle those conditions. We can't continue to ignore them. So uh, I, I think at the starting point is to go to those students and go to those families and find out what it is that they wanna see changed, what it is that they wanna see do and finally get behind them instead of our own uh, biases and interests because that's part, been part of the problem. You know, Malcolm, before you chime in here, I'm gonna ask you to speak to a related question that, that Perry submitted and that is, you know, um, as you were fighting for these additional resources, right, you might have to make some compromises. And so how do you decide where and when to compromise or seed ground, right? And, and how do you decide on what your non-negotiables are, right? And how do we ensure that, you know, talking about the intersection of race and equity and ensuring that the resources we need to do right by the kids we care most about and the kids who are most vulnerable, right, is not a place where we cede ground or compromise. Well, well let, me, let, me, let me push back a little bit on that, only to say this. I think a part of how you get what I think Carrie is asking is I, I try not to use the word compr compromise. Um, it's about building consensus. Um, consensus is much better language in terms of what I think folks want in terms of an outcome. <clears throat> I think people are clear right now that in many, many ways, government does not work or has not worked for their family. I think that there's a couple of reasons that I see for, for, for that. Um, Alberto talked about power being at the, the basis of organizing and I, I agree with that and it reminds me of something that I often say that politics is a math problem, right? This is a math problem. Can we get 102 votes 
in the House to pass a bill? Can we then get 26 votes in the Senate? And then do we have a governor that's in place that's really willing to sign that bill? And then do we have a judiciary of people who are going to interpret the law in a way that's not to buttress uh, corporate interests, but interpret the law in a way that the legislature wrote it um, and wanted to see it implemented? And so this is a holistic approach to power building. And when we talk about consensus, it, it really bugs me this idea that you can even find consensus if you don't know where you stand, right? And so I think that there's sometimes been this belief that I have muddled policy positions, thereby I'm gonna be the best elected official to find compromise on, on both sides, which I like never wanna hear here again. Um, the reality is your values don't get left at the door. And I think it's actually easier for people to, who know exactly what they believe and where they stand to find consensus with people who also know where exactly what they believe and where they stand, because then it becomes easier to really see where is the Venn diagram, right, of things that, that, that we actually agree on, because what I believe and what I'm clear about um, is clear to you. I think a lot of times people think negotiating is about trying to one-up somebody or trying to hide your intentions. No good negotiation starts with us coming to the table being very clear about what our values are. And so if we have a value about lifting up community, there's no middle ground on, oh, well, Malcolm, we're only gonna burn down half the community. I know you love the community. I wanna burn down half of the community. And so a compromise is we only burn down 10 of the five houses. Like, no, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't work. We have to, as a starting place, and this is, I think, I think there are two things, and I'll just end there. I think there are two things that make that consensus building really impossible right now from where I sit, and I hope it becomes more possible in the years ahead, because hope springs eternal. The first is we have to share facts. We have to share facts. I think that we are in a position right now, we're in a place where all of us have been inundated now for two months and it has continued even after six people died because of the lies that have been told. The lies have continued around whether or not we even had a free and fair election. And so that is one of the most profound examples. Um, well, maybe not the most pr pr profound example because we also had folks for months now saying COVID is not real and it's not a thing. And that has created a whole echo chamber of folks who I work with who do not share facts. And so until we change that, I'm not sure how we're gonna be able to move forward on anything else. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and I think Elizabeth Warren and others have said this, um, personnel is policy. Government doesn't work for working people because enough working people are not in government. I mean, over half of members of Congress are millionaires. And that's not just a Republican reality, that's reality of Democratic members of, of, of Congress as well. And I think the impact of that is that all the things that we are talking about as it relates to our young people, as it relates to um, Black folks and, and Black lives, for a lot of folks, good people um, who, who might be allies in every sense of the word, um, I'm not sure, maybe Rosa said it, that the what we're looking for in terms of solutions are gonna come from the people for whom this is not hypothetical, are gonna come from the people for whom are directly impacted on a daily basis. And so when we talk about wages and wage stagnation, that's not something I read about and was like, oh, this sounds bad, I wanna get involved. Nothing wrong with people who said, oh, that's not my experience, but like, oh my God, I wanna get involved in that. But at the end of the day, when it's time to really craft the policy, the folks who have to be centered in that are the people who are most impacted by what's going on. And so we have to have elected officials, particularly from the vantage point I'm in, of people who come from a variety of lived experiences and also people who are willing to share facts and build consensus around areas where we have mutual values. Thank you for your offering of Hope Springs Eternal. Uh, <laughs> I needed that. Um, and I often find um, my, my sources of hope and optimism come from interactions, engagements, conversations I have with young people, right? Um, because they always prove the possible for me. And so we have a question here um, from Eve about, you know, what you would suggest a young person who desires to get into 
your field, right, who is leaving college, what kinds of early career experiences you encourage them to pursue. And, and one of the reasons I wanna elevate this, this, um, this question is because, you know, fundamentally the work of organizing is leadership development, right? It is about investing in relationships and investing in people. And um, all of us are talking about education and, and the ways in which schooling has done right by us and not, right? And as we think about some of the enriching opportunities that young people have, for a host of reasons, a lot of those supports and connections are cut off once young people leave their K-12 experience, right? And those of us who are first-generation college graduates, who are you know younger professionals or emerging leaders know how important it is to have sponsors in your work, right? People who are looking out for you, who are helping you sort of navigate the career path that you were trying to set out for yourself. And so I wanna elevate this question because I think it's one that we should be thinking about as young people are looking to us and saying like, hey, I didn't know I could do that, right? And now that I see someone who looks like me, who shares my background doing that, I want to do that too, but where do I start? So I'm hoping you all have some advice, some guidance for Eve and her peers. And Rosa, we can start with you. Yeah, I mean, first, most of most of our people don't go to college. So if you're framing it within a college only, it, it most of our people just don't go to college and less and less um, white young people want to go to college. I think when I think everybody has to be clear right now. When people like, you know, have said already on 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 this uh, in this talk, nothing's going to look like before COVID. Colleges and universities right now are going through a reckoning where they are getting rid of tenured full professors, which means many of them will not survive the next one or two years that we will be in this COVID process. What we have to be teaching young people is self-determination. How do you get land and grow your own food? If you go to college, are you going to be an engineer for big oil or are you going to be an engineer around wind turbines? You know, like all of this stuff right now is we have to be teaching our young people. Most of what's being taught in, in public education from middle school to high school does not relate to where these young people are going to have to go to have sustainability in the future. Right. And now with the virtual learning, as Alberto was speaking to, they're beginning to see like, I could just Google what my teacher has been telling me for two years. You know, like, why do I have to like, why do parents have to spend money for private education or or college? So I think what's what it is, is about really going back to the roots of us as African descendant and indigenous descendant people and our practices, even around medicine, you know, even around how do we heal our communities? How do we talk about mutual aid? Because young people I know are realizing that their faith is tied up together, even though there are what the, the, the white supremacy and everything that is happening. I, I do just want to say something that because I've seen a couple people already um, say that we sound bitter. I would say I, I, I probably am right now. I can't talk for everybody else. You know why? Because white supremacists are going to be in the streets from January 17th to the 20th in all the capitals. And I happen to live in Albany, New York. And I cannot have my husband go out there right now, my daughter or myself, because Proud Boys are in their trucks around Albany, New York. If that's happening in Albany, New York, in New York State, what do you think is happening everywhere else? The fear right now that our people have is real. real because what happened last week was not just an insurrection of taking rid of some elected officials who they were planning to take hostage and assassinate. It is about whiteness. And I didn't say that, Nancy Pelosi said it last week. 
Right now, there are half this country, for some reason, feels that we are taking things away from them. When the reality is that we as people of color are now under the trauma of COVID and don't even know at this moment if we could walk outside, if we live in a capital. And the FBI is telling us that they are prepared and they're ready. And I know that was off topic, I am not like in the classroom right now. I am a person that speaks truth to power. I'm an organizer, but I cannot allow people to say, why, why do y'all look unhappy? Yeah. We're trying to live right now. I'm trying not to get killed in the streets when I go pick up my cleaning. So I'm, I'm not bitter as an organizer. It's just that we as black and brown people are now in a place where we are consulting with each other and making phone trees and printing out maps so we know how to get to our people or get to a safe place when what's about what y'all saw happen last Wednesday, what we saw, that was a test run for the next two weeks in this country. So I'm sorry, but I just had, you know, I had to speak my truth because to anyone saying why it, 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 it blows my mind and it shows a complete lack of wanting to deal with the fact that this is a country that's been a failed project ever since it stole African-Americans, brought them here, took indigenous people's land, exploited women and exploited laborers. And we're seeing the empire fall and they are blaming us when we continue to save this country from itself. Can I make two quick points um, in, yeah. in terms of advice to, to, to young people? So uh, James Baldwin is my, my, my favorite writer and he has a, a quote, he says, you know, you have to go the way your blood boils. And so the first thing I would say to folks is find the thing that you're passionate about, the thing that really resonates with you, that you think about, that you've lived, that you understand and get involved in that thing. Um, you know, for me, as I, as I said, um, you know, for me, it was it was it was deep poverty, and I'll never forget the first time I ever got civically engaged. Um, I was 11 years old, living on a block in my district uh, right now, and I, you know, ran home to my mom, just talking about. I can't remember exactly what I said, but talking about the challenges as I saw them. Um, and my mom, God rest her soul, tough black lady, without skipping a beat, she said, "Well, boy, if you care so much, go do something about it." And that has that voice, which I can still hear from her in the back of my head all the time is that if we care, um, we have a responsibility to do something about it. There's nobody who's gonna come and, and save our, our communities. And if, we, and if we are gonna do something about it, I think a part of what we have to do is acknowledge the reality of where we are. I mean, as an elected official, if I didn't have faith in our ability to make our government work for people, I wouldn't do this job. I, I couldn't do this job. I couldn't get up every day if I didn't have faith. But faith is not blind optimism. Faith is a recognition first of where we are and requires me to think through how we get from where we are to where we need to go. And as a leader, I have a, a moral responsibility to be honest with people about the challenges we face. And my now chief of staff who ran my campaign would always say to me, Malcolm, you can't say this, but I said it all the time. You know, when I got elected, I never thought the sky was going to open up and that birds were going to fall down and all the issues we've been dealing with for years would now no longer exist. Um, elected officials are one part of a coalition that we have to build to then deliver on solutions to the challenges that are most impacting people. So I have a lot of faith in us to get from where we are right now to a future that's better. But I also understand that that's going to require hard work and hard truths on our on our part to address that. Thank you. Alberto, you raised your hand. Lean right in. Uh, I just want two, three thoughts. Um, one, um, just in solidarity with, with what Rosa said. And uh, you know. I think you're blocking your mic. Am I better now? Sorry. Better. Okay. Thank oh, yeah, you. Cool. <laughs> I, I just in solidarity with what with Rosa said and uh, yeah. 100% uh, got your back. And we have every right uh, to not be angry in this moment, to not be bitter in this moment um, is scary. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it just is. And, you know, America is taking from everybody except the top. 
So we're, they're taking from, yes, some folks more than others. That is a reality. Black folks, indigenous folks. I mean, yes, it's not about oppression Olympics, it's about being realistic. Some people are getting really hammered right now on multiple fronts. Um, you know, uh, Latinos in, uh, in California, you know, 40% of the population yet, 55% of all deaths. So people are getting it. Some people are getting it more than others. The trauma inflicted is significant. But make no mistakes, white people are getting it too. They're getting the stuff taken from them. And to at what point can we build a coalition strong enough where white folks can identify with their class interests before their racial interests that's being thrown at them by Trump, who doesn't care about them, right? Or these white insurrectionists to build the kind of coalition really necessary to, to move these other places along. Because I feel for them too, I really do. I, I have a lot of compassion for them folks that feel as, as much as I might disagree with the loss that they're experiencing, uh, everybody's losing right now. Uh, the, the amount of people dying from, from, from meth and, and drugs and, and methamphetamines and, and, and prescription drugs and filling up, like this awful. So that's got to change. Um, not at the expense of my story, and not the expense of my of my experience, but we got to we got we got to get it together. Uh, I think in organizing with young people, we'll just close close on this part. Um, we have to believe that young people are smart, have capacity, are experts, can organize. They have as much to offer as the Ivy League, Harvard education grad if not more to offer because of their direct experience with the issue. So yeah, it starts in your schools, not by creating these committees of like 10 kids to inform the principal, mass assemblies with students, mass questions around what are the things that really matter to you? What will you change in the classroom? It can't hurt to try two or three things that they're asking for because the two or three things that we're talking about ain't really moving the needle anyway. So it's time for mass experimentation by allowing our young people to drive the agenda and get behind them. You want leadership. You want them to be principals. You want them to be teachers. You want them to be mayors. You want them to be uh, activists. Empower them to do that now and support them along the way. Guide them along the way. Build that kind of coalition because until we do that, I mean, that's what principals should do. That's what teachers should do. We should open up the runway, get out the way and get behind them and support what they want. What, what curriculum do they want? What, that's, that I think is the time to throw away this factory model education and get behind our young people for a few years and see what, what comes to bear. And I guarantee you more will come to bear from that strategy because we've been doing that for 25 years. That's how we were able to create college access for every single student in our district. That's how we were able to cut $25 million from the LA Police Department. That's how we were able to, di to direct uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to highest need schools. That's how we were able to push for uh, uh, ethnic studies in our schools is by turning it over to young people. And none of these things are a magic bullet. Not any one thing is gonna change it. But over the course of 10, 20, 30 years, we will see the kind of dramatic shift that, that we need to see. I want to say thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Rosa, for your reminder that we do not live single issue lives. Um, and, and thank you all for the encouragement to young people and to center young people in our work. Um, we are at time. Uh, <laughs> and so I can't believe it because I have so many other questions that I wanted to ask. And I know that there's so many more in the Q&A. Um, I know that there's an opportunity to engage in this conversation virtually um, next week as part of a Twitter town hall. I will let the Hutt Institute team tell you about that. But if there's something that this conversation sparked for you, all of us are, you know, pretty responsive on Twitter. So if you if you hit us up, uh, you will definitely get some engagement and a response there. And I want to say thank you to each of our panelists for bringing yourselves, your passion, your expertise, your experience, your insight to this conversation to the Hunt Institute for allowing me to moderate this conversation with three people whose work I have admired for a long, long time. Uh, and for each of you who showed up, asked your questions, pushed us uh, and were vulnerable. So, and with that, I will hand it back to you, Zinevo. Thank you. Thank you, Sharonda.
for leading an absolutely amazing start to the race and education webinar series for this year. We could not be more grateful that you all came up and talked about the need for mass experimentation and organizing uh, to set the new year off right and to set all of you who have joined in your work in communities. Thank you for it. And let's continue to push and do more to achieve educational equity for our young people. Uh, the Hunt Institute is offering a variety of great programs to make sure that you're engaged, informed, and activated in your work for educational equity. Uh, on January 19th, we will have our homeroom with education leaders supporting housing and food insecure students during the pandemic. The link for that conversation is in the chat. And then we will also have our next race and education webinar, the intersections between racism and gender and education happening on February 4th of this year. So thank you all. Please make sure you register for those conversations. And we are going to send a follow-up email about the Twitter town hall details for next week, Tuesday at 12 p.m. But thank you. This has been a amazing conversation and it's been such an honor to listen into it. Thank you, Sharonda. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, Rosa. And thank you, Representative Kenyatta. And thank you to the Hunt Institute team. Have a safe and healthy rest of your day. Thanks, y'all.